My name is Nicole Delma. Uh, as I mentioned, I used to run email programs for companies including J. Crew, which you might be familiar with, uh, for Condé Nast and its 28 different publications, for Getty Images, and most recently with the Huffington Post. Um, I've had the honor of working with a number of different uh, publications over the years, including Vogue, Wired, Glamour, and some of the brands that I've had the opportunity to work with, which now amount to hundreds, are some very well-known companies that you might be familiar with here as well, including Bloomingdale's, Coach, Nike, Nordstrom. So with that background, I wanted to let you know that today we will be touching on each of these different topics as they pertain to email and what I am calling the new best practices, which are really in many ways not very different from the old best practices, except that there's so many different new technologies and options for us to choose from now that we have to rethink what our priorities are and how we approach having a best-in-class program. Before I, I jump into those different areas, I want to touch on the, the two parts of email that I mentioned are the most important. Um, email has now surpassed land mail as the most valuable data point on your list. So capturing an email has the highest dollar value of any other data point, and it's going to be the piece of customer information that stays with you for the longest period of time. So it's important that we value those emails. Secondly, email is certainly uh, by far the most lucrative channel. Uh, in this survey of numbers that was uh, sent out by the USDMA last year, they took a look at all of the different channels, and of course we know there's all kinds of activity happening in social and mobile, and while those areas are incredibly exciting, uh, and we still of course have land, mail, and telephone, there's no other channel that compares with email. Uh, and that in the US, for every dollar invested in email, we're still seeing an average of close to $40 coming back. So that's a substantial difference for many of the channels that are behind it. What's more exciting is that in the next couple years, email is not expected to decline. So while I've been in this uh, channel of email for 10 years, I remember about five years ago, where many of my colleagues suggested that I should move beyond email and get into social because email was going away. And in fact, the last couple years have been the busiest and the most um, exciting time for email to date because we're finally figuring out how to do it correctly. Uh, based on a survey that was put out by Exact Target here locally in Brazil, uh, email is still the most popular channel for brands to engage with consumers. Of the people in, in Brazil that are on the internet, which is approximately 42 percent, 91 percent have actually provided their email to at least one brand. So while there certainly is engagement in social happening, uh, Facebook at 77 percent and Twitter at only um, 26 percent, people are still much happier to engage with brands in the email channel. Also, Brazilians are not shy to admit that email certainly is influencing their purchase behavior, uh, with 87% checking email from the brands daily, and 68% admit that they have purchased because of email, with 53% saying that they are more likely to consume once they've signed up for a brand's email. So you're obviously doing something very right. However, the one difference I've noticed between brands that uh, do okay in, in digital marketing, the brands that really excel and they see increasing return in their online revenue year over year, is that they realize that email is actually the backbone of their program. And by that I mean that without email, it's very difficult to actually predict against uh, your online revenue. And if done correctly, it is possible to forecast your, uh, your future earnings based off of email, which was something that, that previously uh, people have had a difficult time doing. But we'll talk a little bit about how to do that today. Oh. Oh. Can we get this out? So email certainly is more complicated than ever, as you see from the number of vendors that are out there and all of the different new features and functionality that are being released, that there's, there's more options to choose from and incredibly different ways that you can set your programs up, from dynamic content to complicated segmentation. But does email really need to be that complicated? And how do you decide when your program is ready to move from the basics that you've been doing since you first got into email marketing and jump into some of the more advanced tactics? I, I'd like to use this case study as an example of a, a situation in which a marketer was not ready or they didn't take the, a look at. So several years ago, 
Um, I was working with a bridal brand, so not one of the ones shown here on the screen, but a bridal brand that was very interested in having the forward to a friend option in their emails, which makes sense because if somebody's getting married, of course they want to share out that information with all of their friends. Seems very logical, right? So this particular brand went through a very lengthy process to change email service providers because they wanted this one feature. It was a new feature at the time and no one else had it and they were done with the old forward and instead they wanted this particular forward to a friend feature. So about six months later and several thousand dollars, they implemented this feature in all of their programs and they were very excited as they sat there to see what the result was. To their dismay, two out of every hundred thousand people actually use this feature. So it turned out that this whole migration to a new email service provider, which at that time, you know, several thousand dollars and, and quite a bit of man hours, was misinformed. Much brighter now. <laughs> so I, I just like to caution that before you decide to move to a new technology, always take a look at what it is you stand to gain. And do you have the data to support that move? And I think this is critical because there's a few things that we as marketers have in common which we'll touch on as well, that make us prone to wanting to switch, wanting to move to the new, wanting to be early adopters, which is a fantastic thing, but it quite often prohibits us from going back and fixing the core of our program, which could often be more lucrative than a move. So before we get started, as I mentioned, I have three quick notes that I like to, to overview on marketers, things I've observed in the work that I've done. As I mentioned, number one, marketers are definitely hooked on the new. It's in our blood, it's in our DNA, it's the, you know, at the core that we want to be on the forefront. We want to be the first to have something new and we receive onslaughts of information that give us all different types of options of which we want to test and try and do new and different things. So as we're getting approached with different features and vendors and channels, how do you figure out when it's time to go to something new? I'm going to use myself here as a case study. So last year, I am a very competitive person, and I decided that I was going to do a bike race. And of course, I had to get the very best technology. So I spent far too much money on this very fancy bike that I barely knew how to use. I got a custom fitting, and I was very excited to go home and use it. Of course, I was very, very busy. So by the time the race came around, I went back and used the old technology, my older bike, because I was not comfortable with the new technology and I didn't find the time to actually figure out how to implement and use it. By the following couple months later, I'd found something new. I was onto surfing, purchased a new piece of equipment, and that original very expensive bike was still sitting there. Most recently, this bike was just sold. And the reason that I bring this up as a case study uh, is because I like to leave this visual with you as you start thinking about new technologies or new features or new aspects or strategies with your program to think through how frequently we actually tend to do that. And everyone is guilty of this, but I think in marketing especially, it's careful to think of whether we're looking to move to the new just because it's new or if we've actually done the due diligence to show that we will benefit and will gain from a move. The second piece you know, that I've noticed is that marketers are certainly overloaded with input. And with this, I don't mean that with all of the vendors and all the information. What I mean is that everybody in the world thinks that they're a marketer. And I'm certain that you've, you've experienced this if you're familiar with, or you know, if you've ever shared a popular brand. When I was working with J. Crew, I was almost afraid to tell people where I worked at because they had so much information that they wanted to share with me. They had input on all of the different email programs. And of course, you have to listen to the executives in your company, your colleagues, uh, your customers. But this information comes from people on the street, it comes from your family, and so on and so forth. And so as marketers, we've got to be responsible for protecting our customers from ourselves. Because when it comes to marketing, everybody has an opinion. Lastly, I want, want to emphasize this, it's very important. Marketers must think in terms of systems and goals. And by this, I mean that we want to stay away as much as possible from being reactionary, which is another trait that we tend to have in common because there's so much input coming at us. Oftentimes, we're guilty of moving or doing something because we've seen another brand has done it without actually knowing whether it worked for that other brand. And so we take resources off of a great project that we've done research on and switch to reacting. 
So as I mentioned, we must be the, the people that are responsible for protecting our data asset, which for many of our companies is the most valuable asset within the entire organization. And we must protect the customers from ourselves. I'll give you an example. So a few years ago, I was working with a major retailer. And the CMO came to me. And he said, hey, I've got an idea. I'm tired of looking at all of the emails in the inbox and seeing that we look like a spammer. I don't like th what this is doing for our brand. He was right. It wasn't good branding. But his idea was to move to more style tips and editorial emails. This was a fashion brand. So also a very good idea. The challenge was we weren't thinking, and I, I wasn't thinking as we started to implement this, what this meant for the system. So for several years, this retailer had been mailing sale emails over and over, close to 15 years, and they got to the point where they were mailing sale or discount emails seven days a week. So what we decided to do is we came up with some beautiful new creative that enhanced style tips and that type of thing for the customer, and we decided to send that three days a week and then send the promotional emails four times a week. And the goal was that we would change the brand image, be seen as more of a style leader, and less as just a discount and clearance company. So what happened when we did this? Well, the open rates went up by 15%, which was fantastic. The click rates, though, dropped by 3%. The unsubscribe rates climbed, which was surprising. And email size declined, sales declined by 20%. The one other surprising piece of information is that spam complaints actually dropped by 25%, which is substantial because spam complaints are the number one enemy of, of any email program when it comes to deliverability. So what was happening here? Well, the open rates went up because we were using different subject lines. And with preview panes, customers could now see the new imagery. So they were curious, and they wanted to see what was inside. The click rates went down, though, because we were targeting the wrong type of customer. We had spent several years creating a list that was used to getting discounted emails from us, and that was the service they were used to what we were providing. So the content was incredibly valuable and was worthwhile to these customers. However, we weren't sending it to the right type of customer. Unsubscribe rates went up. And at first, everybody was alarmed and thought, what are we doing? We're, we're sending less spam-like emails. Why are the unsubscribe rates going up? And I think this is incredibly important. It's often overlooked. Your unsubscribe rates will always go up when your open rates go up. And it's not that big of a deal if your, open, if your unsubscribe rates go up as long as your spam complaints decline. People will leave your list. It's a sign that they're engaged and they're letting you know that they're not going to be on your list. But it's not a reason to panic because your unsubscribe rates have climbed, which is often something misunderstood within organizations. As I mentioned, email is a very complex system. And if you pull one lever within the program, you have to think about the impact that it's going to have on all of the different areas. Sorry. Ah, oh, that's much better. So if you think about your audience in terms of all of the different people that have signed up, when you first put your value prop out there, you're, you're asking people to sign up for deals, sales, promotions, and then you continue to mail to those people over 15 years. The people that were interested in style tips are going to fall off of the list. So you've attracted people with an initial value prop. You've then continued to condition them with a certain type of message that they've gotten used to, and they stay on your list because they see this as a service. And then all of a sudden, you switch it on them. Even though you had the best of intentions, you cannot upset the system like that without taking the necessary precautions to prepare your list for this type of a change, which is possible. So in this scenario, because the customer goals weren't met and the customer expressed their goals when they signed up for your list, you had a, a challenge in which the marketers weren't happy because their goals weren't met. So suppose the C CMO came to you with the same proposal and said, let's send less promotional emails. How could you approach it? so that you could send less promotional emails, but not have the same decline in response. The CMO had certain goals. Of course, he wanted to reduce the dependence on those promotional emails. He wanted to improve the profile of the brand, which is very important. And as I understand that in Brazil, there has been a lot of promotional emailing and less editorial emailing. So this is something that many of you might want to be thinking about as you're looking to send content and get off of the cycle of, of discount, discount, sale, sale. He wanted to increase the open rates and decrease the spam complaints, which they, he was successful at. Which wasn't thought about was how do you maintain or increase the revenue? So we know the first approach just to start bailing to the existing list was a failure. 
But what if he had launched at the same time as he was preparing to do this style campaign an acquisition effort to bring in new customers, perhaps working in tandem with publications where customers were very interested in editorial, to start to pack more people on the list that would pad the system so it was prepared to take on this new type of messaging. While we tested this, and to our surprise, or our, our delight, it was actually quite a bit of a success. But in order to be able to switch over to editorial, we had to think in terms of the entire system, how we brought these customers on, what these customers were used to, what the service was provided, and if we switched one of these very important levers, which was the type of content, what would the result be? So and when you start thinking in terms of systems, you start thinking in terms of goals, and I don't mean your goals, but the customer's goals, and if you're targeting correctly, your goals and the customer's goals are matched up, you end up with happy customers that come back, that are loyal, and they spend more money with you. So the key takeaways, try not to be too hooked on the new, don't let all of the information that you're getting from everyone about your marketing tactics change your primary core focus. It's important to stay open to input, but not to be reactionary. And try to think as much as in terms of systems and goals whenever possible. So with all this information, how do you know when it is time to actually approach the new, to switch your programs, move over to things like dynamic content, advanced segmentation? Well, the most important thing you have to do is you must know what has worked for you in the past and what is working. And you would be surprised to know how many companies I speak with that can't answer this simple question. What is really working for you and what have you done in the past? And many organizations in which if you went back and looked into the archive, they're about to employ a marketing tactic which they've already tested before and was not effective for them. So I think before you start looking at moving into advanced tactics and making dramatic changes with your program, you have to have some sort of record of looking at what has worked for you in the past. And that's not to say that things don't change and that platforms won't require you to innovate, but knowing this information and keeping it core is going to be important because your list is going to behave for you in very similar ways regardless of how the technology changes. This is ever apparent when, it, when looking at templates. In my opinion, the most important thing that you should think about with templates is that you need to make the process, whoop, <laughs> pardon me, you need to make it easy for the goals, or easy for the recipient to accomplish their goals. And that is the core purpose with the template. So it used to be very much about where should we put the calls to action, what color should the buttons be, how many words should be in this email, how many images. Just keep in mind that you want to make it as easy as possible for the recipient to accomplish their goal, whether that's to consume information, whether that's to move over to your site and take action, or just to be alerted of something new that's coming up. The recipient goals are pretty basic. They only usually have three general things that they're asking for you. One is that you stick to the original value prop. Nothing upsets a customer more than signing up for something and then they start to receive something else. So I generally advise people to try and be either as vague or as specific as possible in that initial collection of emails so that you can stay true to it. Secondly, they're looking for ease of use, as I mentioned. They want something that's going to be simple for them to jump into. Nothing turns a customer off to your brand, your emails more than receiving an enticing email or offer. They receive it on their mobile device and they go to take action and they can't. That's an incredibly bad experience that will turn the user off perhaps forever from your email program. And lastly, consistency. And by consistency, I mean across multiple platforms and multiple devices. So I like this example from Overstock in which they be the first to know by getting special deals and offers sent directly to your inbox. It's very straightforward. It leaves it open for them to send you lots of different options via email, and it's simple. So they should stick to this original value prop. It's probably not a good idea for them to switch to suddenly sending a very lengthy newsletter, but they should stick to these few things that they invited people to sign up for in the original value prop. So in my opinion, the new email best practice is really to build a design that works across all different devices. And so rather than trying to customize for specific individual devices as the first stage, find an email template that's going to work no matter where it's rendering. And if you're not looking at this, this is something that you should start looking into before you revamp all of your templates. Do you know what your email looks like on different browsers and email clients? Are you tracking? Do you know which devices are sending traffic to your website? Do you know in what proportion? Are you looking across at your email and your creative across multiple email clients, web-based email clients, mobile email clients? And if you're not, 
the majority of the A-B testing that you've been doing on your templates is flawed because there are vast differences in the distribution of the clients that people are viewing your emails on. So if you had a template, for example, that did not work in Gmail and one that did, and you're A-B testing these, you might go with the wrong template. And then you might apply that for the rest of your program when really it was just simply a rendering problem. So I think before you move to advancing your templates and your design, the first thing you want to do is make sure that you're collecting the necessary data so that you understand where your email is actually being consumed and how you're rendering across different devices. So many of you might be looking at me th saying, we don't have all of this tracking, so what can we do now? What can we do tomorrow that we can start implementing you know, some of these best practices and preparing so that our templates work? And this is what I would suggest to you. Start with a staged approach for mobile optimization. Uh, in, in the US, as many as 60% of the emails that people are consuming are happening on mobile or tablet. I've heard that in Brazil, that number is 12%, although I would guess it's even higher, and it's only going to increase. So create a, a template that works across all mobile devices. And by that, I mean something that's 640 pixels wide. You've got all text. You maximize the buttons, and you make the social icons large enough so that they can be viewed on a device, and I've got this, this in notes here so that if any of you want to take a look at the presentation later, we go into more detail about how to optimize across all mobile. The second step is responsive email design, which is becoming the standard, but you don't necessarily need to move to that right away. You can start with optimizing for all devices and then move to responsive email design in which your template actually adjusts depending on which device it's rendered on. The next step is to track your device performance data, and you would do that by working with your email service provider. Oftentimes they have reporting built into the system where you can start to see what devices your customers are on, which is incredibly valuable, especially if you're in the electronic space. And then you can also partner with vendors to get this level of reporting. And the final step of mobile optimization is that you start to actually target your offers and your calls to action specific to whether somebody is, is on an Android or on uh, an iPhone. And some of you have seen this in marketing. It's incredibly effective, but it's certainly not the first priority. The first thing you want to do is make sure your templates work on every mobile device. So the key takeaway there for mobile is to start in a staged approach. Tomorrow, take a look at all of your templates. Rather than have several different templates, it's fine even if you have just one template to start on. And I usually say you don't need really more than three templates, but make sure that that one template works across all devices and you will immediately see lift in the performance of your email program because the people that are receiving those emails on their device can engage with you. Now, I would mentioned the three different templates that you want to take a look at. And this is the, the more specific user goal. They generally have three different uh, intentions when they're consuming email from you. What I call the long form or the newsletter, which is that they want to get all of the content in a single email. And this, in this case, you're not necessarily aiming to drive them to the site. So you want to make it easy for them to be able to read all of your content within the email. And this can be a very long form email, but it should be easy to read on mobile. And this is something that someone might read while in transit, while waiting in line, in their downtime. And they know to get this information in, your, in their inbox, and they're going to consume it in its entirety within your email or within, within their phone. The second type of email is, is the more traditional promotional email in which you're asking them to take action, to buy, to shop, to download. And in that case, the goal, it still remains that you want to get them in the email and move them out as quickly as possible. Quite often, I see that we, we want to do too much in an email. And you'll marry the newsletter type of an email with the promotional type of an email. And what you end up with is less uh, impact in both cases. You know, and, and I think it's great to do different testing, depending on, in particular, what you're selling. But generally, these are two separate types of emails. And they should be designed to help the recipient accomplish that specific goal. The last one is the alert, which is your service email. Should be brief, should go you know, directly to the point. And that is to let someone know information about their account or a site outage, that type of thing. Which brings us to the next topic. Now that we've understood what the, you know, the key is to identify the consumer's goals when you're designing your templates and when you're thinking about your strategy, it gets us into segmentation, which really it gets to be very specific about that recipient's goals. The best segmentation ensures that you're marrying your goals with that recipient's goals. And sometimes that means you don't mail everybody, which I know is a, a novel concept for many different marketers because it seems like a lost opportunity not to mail. But it's actually a, a surefire way to improve the performance of your program is not to mail when it's not relevant. And I always say this, think of emails in terms of people. And this is where email really differs from some of the other channels, from social and, and from mobile, is that someone has given you 
their email. And as much as we might start to think of email in bulk and that we're spamming and we're sending mass communication, to that customer, you know, legally and, and in terms of their permission, they actually gave you that email and said, send me information that's relevant to me. And we need to continue to think about that in terms of relationships. And we also need to think of the fact that we have a history. So when you go to introduce someone in your life, you don't say, this is Bob, he's a blue shirt, drives a truck, and earns X thousand dollars per year. That's not the way that you think of people. The first thing you do when you introduce somebody to somebody else is you, you talk about how you know each other. This is a colleague, this is a family member, this is a friend. And then oftentimes you'll, you'll jump into how you know each other in the context. The dialogue that you have in your email program should be very similar to this. You want to make sure that you acknowledge how you met and what you know about each other about that relationship. And in order to do this, you must make sure that you're tracking this information. And so the new best practice for segmentation, I think, really focuses on tracking so that you can build some history on the nature of that relationship. And you'd be surprised how many programs get very detailed at looking at every single thing that somebody has looked at recently which isn't necessarily the most important at all, because if you've missed the opportunity to communicate with them effectively and you're welcome, and then from there forward, then you've really lost that customer bond and they're less likely to be engaged with you for the duration of your email relationship. So this is a sample file that I, I recommend uh, people take a look at very seriously. And if you're not tracking in your database the original opt-in source, you're missing a huge opportunity. Uh, this is one of the most important sources, or one of the most important attributes for a number of reasons. You know, one is that it shows performance by acquisition. You're spending presumably thousands of dollars to go out and bring in new customers, and then you treat them as emails being equal. And this is something I see quite common, is that people say, oh, it was a great program. We brought in 20,000 new emails. We brought in 50,000 new emails. But you're not then tracking over time how that investment actually performed for you so that you know where to go back and put your dollars in to get similar emails if they're working well or not. Go back to that program if those emails are unsubscribing right away and not having any purchase history. And the second most important, I think, is, is to look at your recent opt-in source because this is that what we did most recently. So you want to be able to ideally track the original and then secondly, the most recent action. And these are the two most important fields, I think, as you're starting to look at advanced segmentation. Everything that falls in between there, all of those different data points, is also very important. But this is going to be the pinnacle of any basic modeling structure. So as I mentioned, original email source and recent email source are the most valuable attributes on your list. But there's other explicit data that you'll want to factor in as you start thinking through segmentation and basic modeling, including other information that has been provided by that consumer. Their profile data, survey responses, demographics, or data you might have purchased from major data providers and appended. But you want to keep the explicit data lean. And this is key. I think a lot of people get the, the sort of data greed, where when you first sign somebody up for your program, you want to ask them 50 different questions about their favorite color, their pet's name, where they like to go on vacation, and so on and so forth. But the reality is people are actually pretty bad at telling you information about themselves. And I've seen this in a number of different channels where they're actually, they might do a much better job of informing you through their behavior. You can collect that data pretty quickly. In a matter of a couple weeks, you can figure out what somebody's preferences are. In fact, you don't even necessarily need to ask them, are you shopping you know, for male or female? You just send them an email that has two options, and then you take a look at which they're clicking on more over the first couple weeks. And so I always suggest that let people show you what they're interested in rather than tell you. Get them into the email program more quickly and then incorporate that data into each subsequent email. And that's how you start to begin getting more sophisticated in your segmentation. And then you build in the implicit data. And the implicit data is all the other touch points that you're seeing that maybe are not happening in the email. Maybe they're happening offline. Maybe they're happening through partnerships where you're appending that data and bringing it in. But this includes you know, attendance at different events, RSVPs, and that type of thing. You want to try to pull that in as much as possible. And that's where you start to build a picture and a basis for the modeling and segmentation. Until you've got these pieces in place and you're looking at the different tracking, you're probably not ready for truly advanced segmentation because you, don't, you wouldn't know which segments are actually going to work for you. But this is how you get started, is by tracking email source and then building in the data that's in between. And as I mentioned earlier, that customers do a better job of showing you than telling you. This is never more true than in frequency. One of the most common questions I get is, how often should I be mailing? 
And the reality is it's different for every single person in this room. Some of you will get every email and open every single email, and some people will get a dozen emails and not open any of them. And what's interesting, whenever I've looked, is that the, when you ask a customer what frequency they'll tolerate, it never tends to match up with the way that they actually behave. So customers who think they want to receive the daily are often signing up for every single daily email newsletter, and so they're not actually going to respond because their inboxes are flooded, whereas customers that think that they don't want to, if you send, want to receive daily, if you're sending them engaging email, they actually will click every day. So now moving on to, to content, which is you know, another very hot topic. Should I be sending dynamic content? Should I be sending videos and that type of thing? Fairly, fairly similar approach here. It's about the recipient goals. But the best content ensures the recipient that they're a good match for the information that you are offering. And this is where we basically assure them that we've been listening and that we remember where we met them. We, we've been looking at what they're interested in. And we're here to provide a service and stay true to that value that we agreed to provide when they first gave us their email. So are you ready to support dynamic content? Yes, if you're ready to do the following, of which we already touched on. If you're ready to track the email source, if you already have a strong welcome program, you might be ready. If you successfully track and target on behavioral data, you've been creating a, a, basically a database of information to see how your segmentation is working, that would inform your dynamic program. There's no sense in going to dynamic if you haven't already seen what's working for you in segmentation. And lastly, if you're comfortable not mailing when there isn't a match. And this is something that is very challenging. And oftentimes, marketers are comfortable not mailing. But then you talk to the finance department or the CEO, and they can't understand why you would not mail. And the reason I suggest that you have to be comfortable not mailing is because attrition, people falling off of your list from in, uh, improperly matched mailing, is one of the biggest enemies of many of the email programs that I look at. In addition, the blocking and deliverability challenges that come along with mailing people Content that's not relevant to them is another huge enemy of, of email performance. So the key considerations, you know, the number one takeaway, dynamic content is really most successful once behavioral modeling has been proven. So make sure that you're first taking a look at your existing program and if you've seen success um, in the segmentation that you're doing, use that segmentation, draw some hypotheses, and then start doing dynamic content. It's great to start with that dynamic content in your welcome program because you'll be bringing on a customer that then you'll have a stronger relationship with for the duration of, of their email uh, subscription with you. Next piece that I get many questions about is reporting. There's so much data available. What on earth should I be looking at? And I think that the best reporting, again, comes back to goals, but it shows how well you're matching the recipient goals with the sender goals. And that's key. You want to see, you know, am I sending the right content to the right recipient? And you'll be able to see that through different you know, important KPIs. Now, one of the other things that I notice quite a bit is that people are not necessarily familiar with email KPIs the way that they think they are. As I mentioned earlier, in, in the case of the unsubscribe, very often we look at our program and we say, wow, my unsubscribe rate went up. This is not good. The unsubscribe rate actually doesn't impact your deliverability at all. People could unsubscribe here and there. If they're purchasing more, you can temper that against your unsubscribe rate and then figure out what you're willing to look at. If you're willing to lose a certain number of customers to sell more to the customers that will stay on your list, then the unsubscribe rate really is a non-issue. You want to be much more careful to look at the abuse and spam rate because that's what will get you blocked and, and out of the inbox, which has been a huge problem in the US with some major retailers getting as many as 50% of their emails blocked last year. So the new email best practice for reporting really focuses on having a clean list as well. And you probably hear the term data hygiene coming up. It's absolutely critical because your reporting is not accurate. It's very watered down. And you're not getting uh, a true read on test results if you don't have a clean list. And by clean list, I mean not only going in and making sure that your data is standardized, but taking people off your list or pausing people on your list that haven't responded in six months or more. You can make an effort to re-engage those people but if they've been on your list for 12 months or more and they haven't responded, chances are they're either not using that email address anymore, you're already going to the junk folder, or they're not wanting to engage with your brand anymore. And it's time to take them and pause them off the list. Um, secondly, touch on you know, benchmarks. I get many questions 
um, you know, about people that ask, what, is, what are the industry benchmarks? And it's very important to consider, not that there's not value in reporting, but industry benchmarks largely come from surveys that come from the marketers reporting the information themselves. And because everybody has a different quality of list hygiene, they're reporting their open rates, either total or unique open rates differently, and they also want to report the highest possible uh, performance, industry benchmarks tend to be highly skewed. So I suggest that you should create your own benchmarks within your organization after you've cleaned your list. And sometimes that means that you might have to toss out the original benchmarks that you've had. And you'll start to get a much more accurate read on your reporting. And until you've done this, you probably don't want to invest in a lot of additional attachments you know, to integrations with partners to pull in additional data because it's only going to cloud what's already sort of a faulty, faulty way of looking at the data. Here's an example of a brand that I worked with um, you know, previously where we took a look at the list and we saw that you know, only 76% of the email list was actually active. And by active, I meant that they'd taken any sort of action in the last six months. And like many other marketers, they'd been mailing to this list repeatedly, daily almost, and then but these people hadn't taken any action. They were virtually asleep. So when this marketer actually cleaned up their list, take a look at the open rates and the click rates just overnight. So if you want to you know, go back to your boss and find out the most effective way to improve your email open rates and click rates, clean up your list. Because automatically, oftentimes I've seen that, that marketers will see as much as a doubling in their open rates, a tripling in their click rates. You haven't done anything differently. You've just taken the dead weight off your list. And the other thing that this helps you do is to get a much faster read on test results. Quite often we do a subject line test or a creative test and we can't see the difference between the two. Yet if we'd worked with recent emails that were responding, it's much easier to get a read. So the, last, the key takeaways there is accurately use your reporting terms and know how to interpret the data. And of course, if you have any questions on that, you, I'll provide my email at the end of this, and I'm happy to clarify, because I think it's really key that we understand what those reporting terms mean within our, in our, our own organization. And to set benchmarks amongst your, your own company, because only you really know how your data is being treated, and you can have that same consistency year over year and quarter over quarter. So what, what can we do now you know, in terms of implementing the email and data best practices? This is the most common question I get. It seems like a lot of different options. You want to be able to walk out of here tomorrow and figure out what's the best thing you can do. Well, this is quite a bit of information, but this is a sample of what I usually put together with, with my clients and the brands I work with. You want to put together a plan. And of course, you know, I'm happy to provide a copy of this presentation. This isn't foolproof and going to work for everybody, but you should take a look within your own organization, identify a few key areas that you want to take a look at, improve on, set your, you know, record what you're currently doing, look at what your goal is, and then put down the implications. You know, what do you need technology resources, creative resources, do you need budget? And have a timeline and a plan in place, and then have some expectation as to what you'll receive out of these different changes. The next thing is you definitely want to immediately start optimizing for mobile if you haven't already done this. And this can be as simple as, as I mentioned, one or three new templates that work across all devices. Quite often you can use your existing templates and retrofit those to work across different devices. But this is the most fundamental thing that you want to do to prepare yourself to have a, a solid email program because the use of devices and tablets, I see many of you using them <laughs> right now, is only going to increase. And that is one of the key places where people are engaging in email and has actually been a huge benefit and a plus for email because people now check their email on their phones constantly and they open almost everything that they receive. And here's just an example here where we you know, take a look at the current example of what many email programs look like on mobile where you can't actually engage, you can't transact. That's a poor user experience and will turn off many users from your email. And that's quite often where you're losing the click or the conversion. You've sent a great email with subject line, they go into the content and they're unable to switch over. So I suggest that you immediately get uh, you know, in there and take a look at how your emails are working on mobile. The second piece is to go in and really look at your management of, of data and your opt-in, opt-out. So one of the other things that we do is we continue to mail to people, and as I mentioned, you have to be comfortable not mailing. If you don't have an opt-down page, I highly recommend that you create an opt-down page right away. What that will do is that it actually cuts your opt-out rate quite, quite substantially, usually by about 25 up to 50% overnight. Most people aren't unsubscribing from your email, because they don't want to hear from you. They just might not want to hear from you as often or at the current time. So give them this option. Allow them to go in, 
opt down from your email program or pause your emails. So something else that within the first you know, week of implementation, you'll see an immediate improvement in your program. And you know, just a note on that, the list cleanup and engagement, this is an you know, example of an inbox that's completely flooded by a brand. It's, it's very poor branding to continue to mail to people if they're not responding to you. So it's not, you know, quite often people will say, just continue to mail. You might get somebody that opens. Not only does that get you blocked, especially in Gmail, which is getting more aggressive, it's a very bad experience to see all of these emails coming in from a brand and becoming irrelevant to that customer. And you spend so much money in marketing and creative and advertising that you wouldn't want to, you know, tarnish that by being the marketer that's not listening to what the consumer is showing you through their non-open of your emails. The next piece is really to clean up your sign up. This is another area that I see you know, quite a number of marketers are, are struggling with. In order to support any program long term and you're putting this effort into the tracking, you, know, you really want to make sure that you're putting your best foot forward in terms of capturing these emails. And as you're doing this, make sure that the value prop that you're offering the customer is going to match the type of messages that you're, you plan to be sending to them. And then the next piece that I, I see quite often we miss opportunity with is the welcome series. This is a fundamental area where you can actually bring that customer on board and assure them that you're going to be sending them valuable messaging that's important and relevant to them. And a number of brands either skip the welcome series, they start the welcome series at the same time they start the promotional series, or they don't use any of the, the data that I mentioned, such as the original opt-in source within the context of that message. It's so easy to track op original opt-in source to say, Hello, thank you for signing up at our recent store, at this recent event, through the sweepstakes. However you collected that email, address them immediately and, and start with that. So that pretty much sums up you know, the, the new email best practices. I wanted to be sure to leave a few minutes. I'm not sure how much time we have, but to answer a few questions if, if you guys have any for me.